today I have uh, Sarah Valentine. I was about to actually you are Dr. Sarah Valentine, and I'm and I'm used to speaking with medical doctors and using doctor, and then I was getting your doctor uh, PhD. So you um, everybody probably knows you as the Paleo Mom, and you have your autoimmune book, The Paleo Approach to Reversing Autoimmune Disease and Heal Your Body, which we is a New York Times bestseller. So congratulations. Thank you. You also have the cookbook coming out. Um, so congratulations on that as well, and your blog, The Paleo Mom. So, uh, and back to the doctorate, you have a doctorate degree in biophysics, is that correct? And Medical biophysics. Medical, bio okay, yeah. all right. So, well, tell us your story. How did you get into this? How did you go from medical biophysics into a massive blog and a New York Times bestseller about <laughs> autoimmune diseases? Um, by accident, <laughs> really the, the, the short answer. I um, started having, I guess I started having health issues in my teenage years. Um, that's when I started really gaining weight. That's when I became morbidly obese. Um, I lost a lot of weight in my early 20s following a low carbohydrate diet. Um, I took up marathoning because I thought that that's what you did when you lost a lot of weight. Um, and then right in the middle of my PhD, I had a major health crisis. And I, um, I developed adult onset asthma that was so severe that I was coughing up blood. Wow. And uh, yeah, they initially thought I had a pulmonary embolism just because it was so dramatic. And at the same time, you know, I'd already been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I'd already been diagnosed with chronic migraines. Um, I already had various skin issues. I had eczema and scalp psoriasis. Um, but that was when more serious health conditions started to crop up. So I ended up with severe acid reflux um, and acid reflux induced asthma. I started to have really strange allergies. I developed a topical allergy to cardboard, wow. which is a surprisingly inconvenient allergy. Yes, have. very. Um, and, uh, and I also started having new skin issues at the same time. It turned out to be an autoimmune disease called lichen planus although it was many, many years before I actually knew that that was an autoimmune disease. Um, well, I was going to actually interrupt and ask you, because as you said, scalp psoriasis, I mean, did, did any, an right. And but, yeah, nobody does. It's really interesting. I started having uh, repetitive strain injuries. Um, I was put on uh, steroids and I was apartment bound because of this health crisis. And I um, gained well, 50 pounds in the first six weeks on super high doses of prednisone. Wow. And, uh, and, and part of that was going from very, very active to uh, not bedridden, but close to it. And the depression and the stress of being a graduate student, graduate school. I don't think there's any graduate students out there who really have a relaxing <laughs> time of graduate school. It's not designed to be that experience. Med students either. <laughs> right. The people who are supposed to heal people are, you know, some of the un most unhealthy people because of what they're going through. I mean, and then we really need to restructure these types of, you know, professional educations in order to support the health of the people doing them. Right. Um, that's a topic for another day. Uh, so I, um, I, and I gained another 80 pounds over the next year and a bit. Um, I ended up having anxiety, quite severe anxiety attacks, quite severe depression, um, basically everything was falling apart and I spent much of the next couple of years on and off steroids. Um, at one point I was taking every single drug available for asthma that had been approved for use in Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, everything, it would always be some new thing. So I ended up with a uh, stenosing tenosynovitis in my left thumb, which thumb is, you know, it's, that's trigger finger. Thumb is not necessarily the most common, um, digit in order to to have that condition in. It was uh, not diagnosed very easily. So throughout that diagnosis process, at one point I had a um, scan, you know, an x-ray with contrast done of my hand. And they said, well, we can't figure out the reason for the thumb pain, but you do have arthritis. Yikes. I was like, I have arthritis? And they're like, yeah, it probably won't be crippling for another like 10 years. I'm like, I'm 27 years old. Why do I have arthritis? Right. Um, and, you know, at the time, too, I was nearly 300 pounds. I was doing a postdoctoral research um, at this point in a very high-profile lab, which was a very high-stress um, position. And I, I was miserable. I was miserable. I look at photographs of me at that time, and as much as I was enjoying my research, I was so unhealthy, and I was so physically unhealthy and emotionally unhealthy. I was binge eating. Um, and so I ended up 
um, in my second postdoctoral fellowship was when I had my first daughter. I had gestational diabetes during my pregnancy with her. I had preeclampsia when I went into labor. Um, you know, it was just health condition on, upon health conditions were piling up. And I made one of the best decisions I have ever made, which was to take a break from research. Um, you know, at the time, I really felt like I just wanted to be a good mom, and that was the main motivator for my decision. But when I look back on it, the main motivator was realizing that I was not healthy enough to even attempt to find balance between an academic career, my next step would have been, you know, assistant professor, and the mom of a colicky baby that never sleeps. Mm -hmm. And probably colicky because of my diet. Right. In hindsight. Um, so making that decision gave me the space to really start focusing on my own health. I realized when my daughter was one that I was um, probably beginning to have type 2 diabetes. Um, I took my blood sugar because I'd had gestational diabetes. I, I knew what to look for, and I was starting to feel really crummy when I ate. Granted, I was not eating uh, great food, mm -hmm. um, but I took my blood sugar one day. It was 200, and that really scared me. So I got back onto this low-carb diet that had worked so well for me in my early 20s, and I lost a lot of weight again. I had a second pregnancy that was much healthier, um, and then when my second daughter night weaned, I started to have more skin problems. So my light complainus flared, and I ended up with lesions, which had always sort of come and gone on my ankles, um, all the way up to my knees, wow. and on my wrists, all the way up to my elbows. And then I started having a few um, lesions on my trunk. And it became, it, you know, it's a painful autoimmune disease. It's very visible. It's this very visible sign of not being healthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I can remember the day where I was, you know, sitting in my, you know, at that point, 18-month-old's bedroom and watching her play and thinking to myself, why, you know, I've, I've successfully lost weight at this point. I've lost 100 pounds. Wow, congratulations. Anyway, I'm active. I, you know, I, I, you know, actively play with my kids. I'm pretty physically fit. Why aren't I healthy? Why do I have eczema and psoriasis and lichen planus? Why do I have such severe acid reflux? Why am I chronically constipated? Um, why do I have carpal tunnel syndrome? Um, you know, why do I have tendonitis in my feet? And it just became this, this really important moment for me again, where I started to look at health as being something separate from being thin. And that was, for me, the beginning of really healing. So I had come a long way in terms of blood sugar regulation, but I still wasn't eating nutrient-dense foods. Um, I still wasn't gluten-free. I still wasn't dairy-free. And those things really made a profound impact on my health when I eventually you know, started doing research, started learning more about the paleo diet. Um, I'm not a person to just jump into these things. So I learned about it for three months. I read everything I could read and then decided I was going to try it. And then within two weeks, I went off all six of my prescription medications wow. um, for asthma, you know, skin conditions, and, um, and uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And that was such a, a motivator to keep going. I became a complete zealot. And it became something where my science background sort of came back into this because I wanted to understand why. Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand, you know, this was clearly beyond simply food sensitivities. And it... Really, that was the beginning of my journey that brought me to New York Times bestselling author and writing books that are resources for the autoimmune disease community because it was me finding something that was working for me, but then also being really deeply invested in understanding the scientific mechanisms behind it and what, what is specific to me as an individual versus broadly applicable. Um, and that was, for me, you know, the, the big change. And it's been a huge learning experience ever since because I'm, I am a scientist by nature and by training. And so, for me, understanding these whys and then helping other people to understand them and helping to communicate that information um, is, is, it feels like what I'm meant to do, if that makes any sense. Oh, it sounds like it's what you're meant to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's that sort of um, perfect storm of, um, you know, my scientific background that it was in uh, inflammation and epithelial cell biology combining with now understanding inflammation and epithelial cell biology in the context of, you know, nutrition for autoimmune disease. And it, 
it motivated by my own personal journey. And I think it's also just the importance of, or to say the importance to the people listening out there of food. I mean, really, uh, you know, we'll talk about a lot of different things as, as we're going through this and people have heard of, uh, about a lot of different factors in autoimmunity, stress and toxins and, and the gut, um, but the power of food, I mean, really you, you point back to really just making a change in the diet and within a couple of weeks being off six medications yeah. and that's profound. So people listening out there, I mean, it, for some people, their autoimmune disease has you know, been years and years and it may take some time to get out of it. And for other people, it can be very profound and very quick. And um, so I, I always like to point that out to people I've seen, and I'm sure you have as well, after people reading your books, just the profound differences that can happen in a lot of people in a very short amount of time. And some people, you know, I have talked with people who have been out of wheelchairs in two days. Like it's just a, a miracle. And then there's other um, people who, you know, there's, there's, such a accumulation of factors that contribute to such dysfunction of the immune system. So for some people, there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle that need to fall into place before they can really see that substantial healing. And for me, you know, I do want to emphasize that as much as I was off my six medications in two weeks, it was then a year of experimenting and refining and understanding the role of nutrient density, understanding for me, my, my severe sensitivity to nightshades, mm -hmm. um, understanding just how much I had to prioritize stress management and sleep for me to really see complete healing of my skin. So as much as I saw this dramatic difference right away, it's been a journey that I've continued on to optimize. And my, my skin really didn't start clearing up until around the one-year mark. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I saw a big difference right away, but then there was this sort of stubborn, these stubborn lesions on my ankles that had been there for eight years. Um, and they really took me getting everything in place um, to, to make them go away. And then, you know, I've had the very frustrating experience of being accidentally exposed to foods mm -hmm. I'm clearly very sensitive to. And for me, an autoimmune flare means suddenly my ankles are covered in lichen planus lesions, and then they take several weeks to, to heal. So, um, so as much as I noticed huge improvement right away, and it was this um, amazing time in my life, it's something that continues to require effort on my part. And I completely agree. I mean, I, I myself had autoimmunity and, and um, you know, for some people, it, it just don't give up hope. People listening out there who haven't had this dramatic uh, recovery within a couple of weeks, it can take months to years. And then I feel like we just, you know, there's a weak chain in the link and we always have to be careful. I mean, I'm constantly, you know, my patients will say, well, you know, can I get off this supplement or that supplement? I'm like, it's completely up to you. We live in a toxic world. So I personally take all five of these, you know, every day just because it's a you know toxic world or whatever, you know, glutathione and the precursors. I mean, you know, I just, I do do all that because, you know, I have, uh, even in my journey gotten, you know, a relapse or gotten sick and then getting better. And, and so, and there always be times of accidental exposure or a death or a divorce or a, you know, some a graduation or graduate school, some stressor that is, you know, making the ridiculous decision to take a red eye flight home, yeah. which was my most recent one. Yeah. Oh, right. I just I should have remembered how vitally important sleep is to me and yes. how much my body fell apart after just one night of bad sleep. Yes, me too. Yes. <laughs> well, so let's talk about the cornerstone of the paleo diet is, is, you know, the, is healing the gut. So kind of tell us about that. We've had a lot of people talking about leaky gut. Most everybody mentions it in their lecture, but give us sort of your rundown on that. And then we'll get more into the food components. Well, I think when we're talking about, I mean, chronic health problems in general, but, um, you know, this is really uh, fairly well understood now with autoimmune disease, just how vitally important gut health is to um, or lack of gut health is to developing autoimmune disease. So we now know in every autoimmune disease in which of uh, the presence of a leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability as um, you know, scientists are, are more apt to use that term as opposed to leaky gut. But we know that it's there in every autoimmune disease that we've looked at it in. Um, and in every autoimmune disease that we've looked for the presence of gut dysbiosis, where the microorganisms that are living in the gut are either the wrong kinds, the wrong relative quantities, the wrong absolute quantities, in the wrong place, you know, something is wrong. And, and most commonly that's overgrowth, um, most commonly bacterial overgrowth, sometimes yeast overgrowth. And that's, I think, 
the more common experience, but it really just means it's not right. And it can mean you've got the right numbers, but just the wrong kinds. It can also mean undergrowth, depending on um, exactly what's going on in your body and how you're eating now. We know that gut dysbiosis has been present in every autoimmune disease in which it has been investigated. And when we think about gut health and immune health, it's really easy to understand how important those things are to each other. So roughly 80% of the immune system is housed in the tissues surrounding the gut. It's um, the primary barrier between our bodies and the outside world. I mean, it's hard to think of the stuff that you're digesting that's inside your digestive tract is actually outside your body, but it, it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's a, such a vitally important barrier when that barrier is not doing its job. And it has a very complex job because it has to be selectively mm -hmm. permeable. So it has to let nutrients in, keep everything else out. And so when that barrier starts to break down, then the immune system is there to be stimulated. And we're now starting to understand it's even more complex than just that barrier being um, intact. Um, we call it gut barrier integrity. Because now we're starting to understand that the bacteria that live in our gut can control how uh, exaggerated immune response you have to things that are maybe leaking in. They can control um, the, how tight the junctions are between cells. So it can actually control whether or not your gut is leaky. So those things go hand in hand. Um, and because we've got this, you know, in autoimmune disease, we have this completely dysfunctional immune system where part of the immune system is overstimulated, part of it's understimulated. Um, and we've lost our ability to differentiate between our bodies and a foreign invader. And so we have this sort of perfect storm of, you know, of bad things happening in the immune system where it just, it just completely loses the, its ability to do its job. So you have the immune system attacking yourself, but at the same time, you're more susceptible to infections because you can't actually fight off an infection very well. And we are now understanding that this is really linked to other things, hormones and nutrient density, but it's really linked to gut health. And so if you have an autoimmune disease and you're looking to heal and you're looking to um, include you know, diet and lifestyle as part of your, you know, treatment strategies, healing the gut becomes, you know, an absolute cornerstone to that strategy. Um, and it's, it's an important concept in, in all chronic illness, because if you have stimulation of the gut immune system, you have inflammation, but it just, you know, the research really supports that it's absolutely fundamental for autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's talk about, I mean, we, many of the listeners probably at this point know about the dangers of gluten and dairy and sort of the other inflammatory foods, but something that we haven't talked about yet on the summit is about um, grains and legumes and why those are inflammatory or potentially damaging to the gut. Can you walk us through that? Absolutely. So there's, there's actually a variety of ways that grains and legumes um, can irritate the gut barrier, disrupt the gut barrier, cause a leaky gut, stimulate the immune system, uh, contribute to gut dysbiosis. And, um, and there's, there's definitely, um, definitely different grains and different legumes are sort of differently potent when it comes to these effects, um, which is why we see sort of in some individuals say some individuals are fine with rice. But when we look at these things sort of broadly, we see that there are a couple of compounds that are found in all grains and all legumes that are sort of universally problematic. And when you're talking about autoimmune disease, you're talking about somebody with a genetic predisposition. So we have a genetic predisposition to have our immune systems overreact. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us have a genetic predisposition to our guts becoming leakier um, in response to compounds that are in these foods. So um, a couple of the main culprits are um, what a lot of people call lectins, but that's sort of a misnomer because lectins are, they're simply a carbohydrate binding protein found in all forms of life. We have lectins in our own body. Um, and to sort of demonize lectins is, um, it's too general of a term. So we end up, you know, there's, there's plenty of lectins that are actually, you know, essential for, for our lives. But there's uh, certain subclasses of lectins that are found in high concentrations in grains and legumes that we do know are problematic for human health. Um, and those are prolamines, which are uh, pro, you know, proteins that are rich in the amino acid proline, that's where they get their name from, and agglutinins, 
for another type of lectin that they get their name from their ability to make red blood cells clump together or agglutinate. Um, they're both actually very rich in the amino acid proline. Um, a, the most common example of a prolamine is gluten, and it's also the, the most studied. The most common example of an agglutinin is wheat germ agglutinin, um, but also soy lectin um, is a very common example um, that people will have heard of, or peanut lectin is also. Those are both agglutinins. And they, both of these types of protein have ways of interacting with the gut barrier and crossing the gut barrier intact. They're quite sneaky, so we're not supposed to be allowing intact proteins into the body. We're supposed to digest them into um, individual amino acids, and then the individual amino acids are um, absorbed through the gut barrier. Um, but prolamines and agglutinins, they have different mechanisms, but they're very, very good at tricking the cells that line the gut into bringing them across. So we know with prolamines um, that there's some receptor binding that can happen at the cell, and they're then internalized. Um, in some cases, it appears as though when they're internalized, they actually damage the cell. Um, and when you have a damaged cell, you have a, a damaged gut barrier. You have a, you know, if the cell dies, you have a hole, things can leak in. Um, and in some cases, um, these prolamines are able to, to trick the cell into bringing it across. So then you just have this issue of an intact protein inside the body um, where the immune system is there. And the immune system goes, intact protein, that's not supposed to be here, right. it's foreign. And then you get a stimulation of, of inflammation there. And we know that these proteins are so good at crossing the barrier, and they're so good at stimulating the immune system. And some of these are being investigated for use as um, carrier molecules for drugs. So mm -hmm. wheat has been investigated as a carrier molecule for drugs to get inside, help other drugs get inside the body. Some of them have, are being investigated for use as adjuvants in vaccines because they're so good at stimulating the immune system. Uh, soy lectin is one. Um, they're so good at stimulating the immune system that we go, hey, well, if we put this in a vaccine, then we're getting that stimulation of the immune system so we get better immunity against the, um, you know, dead virus or whatever it is right. that's in the vaccine. So um, when it comes to consuming these things in food, we need to understand they're very poorly digested. Uh, so our, we just don't happen to make digestive enzymes that are very good at breaking these proteins apart. They're very good at crossing the gut barrier. They're very good at stimulating the immune system. Agglutinins have an even, I think, trickier way of getting across the gut barrier because they actually bind with uh, glycoprotein. So they actually bind with the carbohydrates that are in the cell membrane and stimulate um, endocytosis. So they actually stimulate the cell to sort of swallow them up and transport them, which is part of how a cell, uh, you know, these particular cells transport nutrients across the gut barrier. Um, and we, we know that it's a spectacular stimulator of the immune system, especially mm -hmm. TH1, TH2, and TH17 cells, which anybody who's looking at sort of the um, the overactivity of, of certain populations of cell types and immune system will sort of recognize those as being the, the bad ones that you don't want to be um, overstimulated. So, um, so they we know that in everybody that they are a challenge to the integrity of the gut barrier. We know that in everybody that they're stimulating the immune system. What we don't really know is how genetic susceptibility plays a role. So we know a little pieces. So we know in the case of gluten that if you have certain genes that your body produces more zonulin um, when gluten binds to certain receptors in the cell membrane and that zonulin um, is then secreted inside the gut, it then binds with receptors in the cells and it opens up the junctions between cells and causes tiny, tiny little holes, but enough to definitely cause a problem. Um, and this is one of the you know, dominant mechanisms in celiac disease that's causing the incredible damage to the um, gut barrier that we see in celiac disease. And this has been found in other autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. where we have this genetic predisposition to having a leaky gut in reaction to gluten because of this mechanism. So other ways that gluten or other prolamines or wheat germ agglutinin or other agglutinins can cross the gut barrier, we still don't understand where genetic susceptibility intersects those mechanisms. So we still don't understand that, you know, if you have, um, you know, these particular HLA gene variants, um, 
that you may be more susceptible to having a leaky gut reaction. We don't really understand that. There's a few places where we understand the intersection of nutrient deficiencies. So we know, for example, having zinc deficiency will uh, make us more likely to have a leaky gut in reaction to gluten. Um, but where that plays in as a general mechanism for general health, we still don't understand. And isn't that a little bit like where the chicken or the egg, because if you have a gluten uh, issue and you have a leaky gut, then you're not absorbing, digesting or absorbing your zinc as well. Zinc modulates the immune system. So it's a little bit, you know, did you have the zinc deficiency because of that or did the deficiency in that create that? Well, exactly. So one of the other huge concepts with autoimmune disease is nutritional deficiencies. So we understand that um, deficiencies in basically every nutrient that has a role in the immune system, which is most of the nutrients, has been found in autoimmune diseases. So zinc deficiency is, is probably the most studied, vitamin D deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, certain B vitamin deficiencies, um, other mineral deficiencies like magnesium and iron. We see these in autoimmune disease. And we even have studies that show that if you supplement with some of these, that you can actually you know, make symptoms better in autoimmune disease. So it, that's an amazing intersection with the digestive health, because if you have a leaky gut, if you have stressed out um, gut epithelial cells, the cells that line the gut, they're not doing their job of absorbing nutrients very well. So then you end up perpetuating those nutritional deficiencies, even once you start focusing your diet on more nutrient dense foods. Right. So back to the prolamines you mentioned, you know, the peanuts and the soybean, are those the two most inflammatory ones? And if, or, you know, what about black beans or something? I mean, I always get the question of how long do I need to do this for, you know, right on the, on the, because I, I do a very similar protocol in, in my book and in my practice where I'm getting people off, you know, getting them more on a paleo type diet and getting them off the grains and legumes. And, you know, at what point, if at all, can somebody reintroduce these? And then are there foods that are more of a problem than others? So could they occasionally eat some black beans, but you'd recommend, you know, absolute no-no to peanuts and soy, given what you're saying? So definitely there is a, um, what there is variety in really, um, you know, some prolamines and some agglutinins are better at crossing the gut barrier. Some of them are better at stimulating the immune system, which means they're worse for you. And they also are differently deactivated by um, heat. So, for example, gluten and wheat germ agglutinin, they aren't really affected by heat. They aren't really affected by um, acidity, so they're not degraded by the um, acid in your stomach. They really, in fact, a wheat germ agglutinin is considered a bioactive compound in the digestive tract. Like it's, it really survives digestion and everything else that would go into processing it to create a food because of course you, know, you can't eat raw wheat it makes you violently ill um so so that is you know the example of like the super hearty you know prolamine and agglutinin that you know are probably never going to be well tolerated by somebody with autoimmune disease then there's for example kidney bean agglutinin or kidney bean lectin it's an agglutinin as many as five raw kidney beans uh, can kill you wow um, it's incredibly toxic in its raw form, but it's deactivated by heat, especially prolonged cooking and soaking. So that's why, you know, when you eat kidney beans, you soak them for a very long time and then you cook them for a very long time. And that becomes more of a traditional preparation method. Mm -hmm. It does some other beneficial things. So it makes the other nutrients that are in a kidney bean more bioavailable so we can actually absorb them. But it's not completely deactivated. Mm -hmm. And so where, some, where we end up with that intersection between a person's um, susceptibility to reacting to mm -hmm. those, um, and then you end up with, you know, some are more or less deactivated by heat. So soybean lectin is very resilient, um, and peanut lectin. Peanut lectin is incredibly resilient to, to heating um, and is phenomenally good at getting into the bloodstream, which is why peanut allergies are so common, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this huge sliding scale, and it depends on individual susceptibility, and it also depends on how these foods were prepared um, and exactly which prolamine and agglutinin you're talking about. And we just, at this point, and very frustratingly so, do not have enough information about each individual prolamine and each individual agglutinin and how it um, 
how it's deactivated by heat or by acidity because if it's deactivated by stomach acid, that's awesome bonus for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and then depending on how proline rich it is, our digestive enzymes can break it up into what kinds of pieces. Um, so if we can break it up into small pieces, we're good. If we can't, then, you know, that's when we start having, you know, intact, long polypeptides that can cross the gut barrier. So we just don't have, like, we just, it'd be wonderful to create this matrix of, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you you can have uh, black beans, but not kidney beans. You can only have kidney beans if they're cooked for 24 hours. You know, we have, you know, soybeans are okay if they're fermented, but not if they're, you know, cooked for a long time or, you know, like, we just don't have that information. Um, there's a few little bits and pieces of papers here and there who've, that have looked at, you know, deactivation of one type of agglutinin um, with different cooking methods. But we just, you know, that's such a phenomenal amount of information to understand the cooking method and sensitivity and quantity. So what is your thought either, you know, from your personal experience, and I, I believe you do some coaching as well on your website. I mean, what is your thought? You know, you have autoimmunity indefinitely off these things, or you heal the gut, your symptoms improve, you're off your medications, you can start trying to add some of these things in on occasion and see how well you can tolerate. Because obviously, I think we would both agree it's an individual. It's an individual. And you got to know what, what works with your body. Are you pretty like, no, never, or not on occasion. So, you know, I, I really feel that there is some genetic adaptation within the human race to be able to, you know, digest and, and handle these substances better. And I think when you look at people as a whole, there's definitely people who seem to thrive eating grains. And mm-hmm. I would never tell that person that, you know, they're damaging their gut because the evidence points to the contrary. Right. So I definitely think that there are people who are very well adapted to eating these foods. I think it's the minority of people. Um, and I think that it's an even bigger minority in the autoimmune disease community because of the genetic predisposition to having mm-hmm. an immune system that's going to overreact um, or an immune system that's not going to be able to regulate itself, that's not going to be able to catch these cells that are producing autoantibodies, like antibodies that are attacking our body, and um, deactivate those cells. That being said... I definitely think it's worth experimenting. I would recommend staying away from gluten um, and other wheat products because of wheat germ and glutenin. I would definitely recommend staying away from peanuts and definitely recommend staying away from soy um, because of what we know about the the compounds in those foods. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to properly prepared black beans or buckwheat or white rice, I think it's worth experimenting, but I would always recommend to somebody to wait until they've seen really substantial relief of their symptoms, that Mm -hmm. their um, blood markers, you know, CRP are normal, um, that they've got everything else down. So Mm -hmm. they're sleeping well, their stress is well managed, um, that uh, they have zero digestive tract symptoms, uh, the quality of their bowel movements is spectacular. Like I'd, I'd really, because of just how many steps backwards we can take mm-hmm. being wrong and being over eager to start experimenting with these foods. Um, but I definitely think, you know, there's a quality of life argument to be made here. When you start talking about um, some of these foods in an overall nutrient dense diet and a person who's taking other steps to look after their health and the quality of life that can come from, you know, occasionally being able to eat lentils. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, we can make an argument that if it's well tolerated and it makes this way of eating sustainable over the long term for an individual, that it's definitely worth experimenting with to find where that individual tolerance is, but also understanding that individual tolerance can vary. So you might be great with black beans and lentils now, but then you get faced with a, you know, big stressful deadline at work and all of a sudden those foods aren't working for you anymore. So, you know, People with autoimmune disease, we all need to be very aware of our bodies, mm-hmm. um, and we need to be sort of constantly vigilant. So as we, you know, um, experiment with these foods, we need to, it's really easy, especially when you talk about high food reward foods, like chocolate and coffee and um, these, you know, just amazingly wonderful foods that do have some um, compounds in them, which can be beneficial, although others, which maybe not so much. But when we start experimenting with these foods, 
it, we so badly want it to work for us. You guys just so badly want, just want to be able to eat chocolate. And for me personally, I do fine with chocolate if I'm getting enough sleep and my stress level is well managed. Mm-hmm. It's one of the first foods that stops working for me when those lifestyle factors aren't there. Um, and so it's frustrating. And, and we are so easy at ignoring symptoms, you know, especially with autoimmune disease. We have so many really amorphous symptoms. You know, it's um, a mild headache or just waking up in the morning not feeling refreshed or, um, you know, a little bit of mild acne or oh, my skin's a little bit dry. And it's so easy to just shove those aside. You know, oh, well, I just cried because of the stressful thing, but it was a pretty stressful thing. And just having these like slightly exaggerated emotional responses, it's so easy to find some other kind of reason behind them and not attribute it to a food network. Mm-hmm. So that definitely, um, that's definitely something that, I mean, it takes a lot of sort of um, self-awareness and presence to be able to um, really experiment with foods in an effective way. Right, right, for sure. And you mentioned for yourself, nightshades don't work. Are there some other foods? Can you tell us about nightshades and what kind of the components as well as maybe eggs? Yeah, so nightshades um, are rich in a type of saponin called glycoalkaloids. And there's actually been, uh, it's interesting because they, they can be deactivated by heat again. Um, and there's, um, there's a lot of people who you know, will tell you that glycoalkaloids are not an issue, but we actually know from the scientific literature that these, um, they're really fascinating. So what they actually do is they bind with cholesterol in the cell membrane. So they insert themselves into the cell membrane, and then they actually reorganize the cholesterol to create pores in the cell membrane. Mm. And this appears to actually be um, what, something that's really important for digestion. So some of these compounds, we see saponins in all foods, like it's one of those sort of universal um, mm-hmm. chemicals found in foods. They may actually help the absorption of nutrients into the cell by creating these pores, these tiny little pores that are transient, um, that will allow certain vitamins and minerals to cross into the cell. But what happens with glycoalkaloids, and especially the glycoalkaloids in the nightshade family, is the pores that are created are more stable and bigger. And that changes the uh, fluid dynamic properties, like the physical properties of the cell membrane. And it ends up creating a stress on the cell. And we know that cells don't like the physical properties of their cell membranes to change. Um, it can actually damage the cells and kill the cells. Um, and again, like there's not really an understanding of whether genetic predisposition is sort of contributing to this mechanism or not. Um, certainly, probably um, dietary fat and omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and sufficiency of cholesterol in the cell membrane is going to contribute here because we know that you know how many omega-3s we have in our diet versus omega-6 is also affects cell membrane um, fluid dynamic properties. So mm-hmm. it changed how well the, the cell can adapt. So there may be some intersections here with other diet factors. But then, so we know that they're really good at sort of stressing out the cell, making these changes in the cell membrane. They're also incredibly strong adjuvants. So they are fantastic stimulators of the immune system and they will ramp up an immune system response to something else. Um, and actually, um, tomato... Uh, lectin and um, alpha tomatine, so both a, a glutenin and um, a glycoalkaloid, have been investigated as adjuvants in vaccines. So it's a combination of those things, I think, that are in nightshades. They're just they're immune stimulators. So the gut doesn't necessarily like them. They're very good at crossing the gut, probably by creating these pores. Although the definitive chain of events that happens to get these inside the body hasn't been figured out. Um, and then they're fantastic immune stimulators. And what's interesting is that there's different glycoalkaloids in different members of the nightshade family. Mm-hmm. Some seem to be stronger than others, like alpha tomatine seems a little bit stronger than alpha solanine, um, which are both found in tomatoes. Alpha solanine is found in potatoes. Um, and there's a few other, there's also some, some steroids, um, capsaicin. Uh, which is what causes the heat and peppers. It's also an immune stimulant and a gut irritant. Um, and so there's, the, I mean, I think the, the dominant issue here is the glycoalkaloids. But there's this sort of collection of immune stimulators. And for me, 
I have a longer lasting negative reaction to members of the nightshade family than I do to gluten. Um, so gluten, I have a really acute reaction, mm -hmm. um, lasts a couple of days, and then I'm on my way to feeling better again. When I've been exposed to tomatoes and chili peppers, I haven't tried, I mean, they're both accidental. I didn't, okay, no, wait. One time I was purposely trying to reintroduce tomatoes and that was clearly not a good choice. Um, but I have you know, months, months of inflammation as a result. So, do you, I was yeah. just gonna ask you, do you find that if somebody reacts to one of the nightshades, they typically re react to all of them? Or do you see that people can react to tomatoes but be just fine with potatoes or eggplant? I, def I see a variety. So um, I definitely see that some people are just sensitive to all nightshades, which mm -hmm. can be really challenging for mm -hmm. people, right? especially Very. with how pervasive paprika is in um, prepackaged foods. Other people do really well on some but not others. So they'll be fine with potatoes and bell peppers but can't touch tomatoes and hot peppers. Um, and I definitely see tomatoes as being the most commonly badly tolerated of mm -hmm. the nightshade family. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's definitely a reaction. And again, it becomes, you know, you play with it. it there's the quality of life argument again, because tomatoes are delicious. Um, I see a lot of tomatoes. It's probably part of why I had a lot of autoimmune diseases. But um, but yeah, so I think that it's, it's definitely worth playing with. And I do have intentions to, at some point in the future, try bell peppers and try potatoes and try eggplant, because I haven't actually attempted those foods. I, mm. I really know beyond a shadow of a doubt that tomatoes and um, and chili peppers, at least right now, are not working for me. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the things about autoimmune disease is it's sort of a constant moving target because as the gut heals and the immune system Absolutely. heals and you restore nutrient sufficiency, you also restore your ability to, to uh, handle sort of suboptimal foods. I sort of consider these suboptimal. So what That's is, not the best. yeah, so what is the kind of the list of suboptimal foods for somebody with an autoimmune yeah. disease? What do you recommend they give up? Um, so foods that I would recommend, you know, when people who are starting out on this health journey that they eliminate initially um, are all grains, all legumes, dairy, nightshades, eggs. So eggs are interesting. It's really egg whites that are the issue, although egg yolks are a common allergy and people actually don't one of the problems with autoimmune disease is we don't we're not necessarily aware of our allergies. So eliminating eggs completely at the beginning, but egg yolks especially um, should be attempted to reintroduce later. Um, nuts and seeds and alcohol. And it all boils down to gut irritants, mm -hmm. immune stimulators, um, and foods that uh, support the growth of not the right kind of bacteria. So we actually know that gluten, for example, um, can support overgrowth of um, the wrong kinds of bacteria in the digestive tract. We germaglutinin. Uh, for some reason, E. coli love wheat germaglutinin. Mm. Um, e. coli is a very common culprit in um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Alcohol also. For some reason, E. coli loves alcohol. Um, so, you know, all of these all of these foods have compounds in them that, you know, ha you know, negatively impact the health of the gut, um, don't support the right type of bacteria growing in the digestive tract, um, and most of them are also immune stimulants, all at the same time. Mm. And then once, uh, and then, you know, at the same time as avoiding these foods, it's really, really important to focus on nutrient density because we understand just how vitally important nutrient sufficiency is for the immune system to regulate. So it just happens to be all of the you know vitamins that are so important for immune regulation that the regulatory T cells actually need to perform their job, like vitamin D and like zinc. Um, we know that these are deficient people with autoimmune disease, and in fact, you know most people are yeah. deficient in these. Um, and so focusing on the most nutrient dense foods when you when you eat nutrient-dense whole foods, you're getting a variety of nutrients, typically in synergistic quantities, so your body absorbs them better and uses them better. Um, often that means supporting digestion when people have um, barriers to digesting effectively, like low stomach acid or suboptimal pancreas function or suboptimal gallbladder function. Um, but it means focusing on eating organ meat, which I know people hate hearing that they have to eat liver, but it's kind of hard to beat liver in terms of nutrient density seafood, um, including like shellfish and sea vegetables, um, high quality meats, 
and lots of vegetables. So you need both the animal foods and the plant foods because there's nutrients that our immune system needs to function normally that you can get from plant foods that you really can't get from animal foods and vice versa. So there's nutrients that we need for our immune systems especially need that we can get from animal foods and not plant foods. And it's not, not that I would ever recommend somebody go on an all meat diet because vegetables are so fantastically important not just from a nutrient standpoint, but from also a prebiotic standpoint. Mm -hmm. So we then are able to support the growth of the right kinds of bacteria and the right quantities in the right location by eating, you know, a lot of vegetables. And actually we know that the two dietary factors with the most corrective influence on your gut microbiome are insoluble fiber from vegetables and omega-3 fats from seafood. Mm. So those two things become so fantastically important and it's this chain reaction, but it becomes a chain reaction of positive events. Mm -hmm. So you become, you know, you're correcting the gut bacteria, so you're helping restore the gut barrier, so you're um, helping to regulate your immune system, so your immune system starts attacking your body, and then you're also providing your body with the building blocks it needs to heal the damaged tissue of whatever, you know, tissue was attacked. If you had Hashimoto's, you know, it can heal your thyroid gland. Um, and, then, and then that's when you start to see real substantial healing. For me, there was a huge difference when I started trying to incorporate organ meat in my diet, and I hear that again and again and again, wow. that um, cutting out toxins is not enough, that you also have to support healing, you have to support Absolutely. the immune system, this also supports um, the detoxification functions by the liver, it supports um, neural health, so it supports brain health, so you start dealing with gut-brain axis, um, you start fixing those problems, and it, it is, it's a chain reaction of things coming together. Um, and that's why it's, it's, uh, I like to more focus on what you do eat rather than absolutely. Foods. Yeah. Um, in large part because of just how important nutrient density is and that focusing on those choices, even before you focus on what you cut out can make such a huge difference. For mm -hmm. This was an amazing overview. I really appreciate it. And anybody who wants more, your book is incredible. I mean, it really is like the Bible. Um, I mean, even for a science geek like me, I was, you know, like, oh my gosh, I got to rest my head a minute. There is a lot of information, but it's really awesome. So anybody wanting more information, highly recommend it. Um, as we're parting, you know, can you give us three to five, uh, you know, sort of take home points, recommendations that people can start doing today if they can't, you know, see a practitioner, or they're trying to do this on their own to either, you know, prevent or reverse autoimmunity? Um, yeah. So I think that, um, I think that diet changes are fantastically important. And I think that focusing on nutrient density first, I mean, it's often an easier transition for people to make before they start eliminating problematic foods. So focus on you're trying to figure out a way to hide organ meat from yourself. You're, you're allowed, you don't just have to hide it from your kids. You're allowed to hide it from yourself. Both focusing on trying to eat more vegetables, focusing on trying to eat more seafood during the week, um, and then start cutting out the grains and the legumes and the dairy and the nightshades and eggs and nuts and seeds. And, and, you know, doing those two things together, people typically see pretty profound differences. But as much as that is point one, and it's the first point to make, it's not the only piece of the puzzle. And if you just make diet changes and don't address stress and don't address sleep, you're not going to get as much out of those diet changes as you could. And it for some people, it completely under undermines all of their other efforts. Mm -hmm. So they're putting all this effort into diet and they're seeing absolutely no benefit and it's because their stress is completely through the roof. So point two is stress reduction, saying no, asking for help, taking up you know stress as sort of resilience activities like meditating, yoga, going for walks outside, listening to music, laughing, um, you know, playing getting enough sleep. So getting enough sleep helps manage stress, but it's also vitally important by itself. So that's point three is have a bedtime. Your kids have a bedtime. So now it's time for you to have a bedtime and it's earlier than what you want it to be. <laughs> and, um, you know, seven hours sleep works for the average healthy person, but it does not work for the average person with autoimmune disease. And eight should be a minimum. Nine is probably better for most of us. Um, and some people, you know, who are experiencing flares, who are in major, their bodies are in major crisis mode, they're going to need 11 or 12 or 13 or 14. And restructuring your life to prioritize sleep is a challenge. And mm -hmm. it's actually probably harder than changing what's in your fridge. So, I mean, those are, and then being active. So that, I mean, that's, we know just how important activity is for um, hormones. And it just so happens that 
It helps regulate hormones that are really important controllers of the immune system. It helps also improve resilience to stress. It helps um, uh, improve sleep quality. So it feeds back into these other factors. Um, so being active, but not too active because overly strenuous activity stimulates yes. the immune system and causes a leaky gut and then that's bad. So what is appropriate activity is different for different people. If you um, have an autoimmune disease that creates barriers to movement, it might mean doing some chair exercises or doing aquatic therapy. Um, if you're a highly active individual, it might be just a question of going for a hike or a walk. You get that time out in nature too at the same time. Um, but, but, you know, avoiding prolonged periods of sitting if you can. Um, and making sure that every half hour you're getting up and you're moving around, you're stretching, like whatever is accessible for you. That also feeds into immune regulation. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big picture. It's, um, it's not just as simple as changing diet. There's all of these things that work together. And when you can attack sort of all of those aspects of your life and, and get everything sort of, you know, ad, at least addressed and improving, you know, that's when people see the fastest um, improvements to their autoimmune symptoms. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. Those were great tips. Um, and your, your talk was amazing. And definitely people go out and get your book and now your cookbook. Do you want to tell people how they can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, so um, the central place of everything is uh, thepaleomom.com. Um, that's where you can get links to my books, my podcast, uh, me on social media. You can get links to my consulting company. Um, I don't actually work with, with um, clients directly, but I have four amazing, um, you know, highly, uh, highly skilled consultants who, who can work with people for people who need a little bit more um, individual attention when it comes to, to these types of um, health journeys, um, and basically everything. Everything's at thepaleomom.com. Great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.